deal with that. All right, so the 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 foundation of what we're going to do. So you have to understand that all of biology is is basically under a paradigm uh, that says that only natural explanations are suitable to explain any event, okay, including origins. So that means the existence of all life forms, every species, life itself, everything can only be explained by natural processes. And that paradigm is, is called methodological naturalism. You'll see that term in a little bit, so you, you don't need to worry about getting it just yet. Um, and and that governs all of biology. For a class like organismic biology, it's oppressive. I mean, it's that that paradigm impacts everything that you learn in organismic biology. And so every chapter you read in the text, probably every single section in the text, it, it is is going to be under a heavy weight of that type of thinking. And so in order to deal with that, we, we have to kind of build a foundation of what is an alternative view to what you would call methodological naturalism. Uh, are there times in which there could be other causes other than natural causes to everything that we have? And, and you could probably imagine I would answer that yes, there are other causes, because if I answered that no, then God could not be involved in any way in creation, and I couldn't teach here. Right. So, um, yeah, so we, we need to we need to deal with this question. Uh, has science has science buried God? And as we do this, we'll, we'll go through a process of what I call reintegration. And so method, methodological naturalism, that idea. And again, we'll see that in a little bit. Um, it's not new. It, it's it's not a new philosophy. It's not a new paradigm. Uh, it's actually very old. Um, probably two to three hundred years. It predates Charles Darwin and his popularizing the idea of um, a evolutionary origins of living forms. Um, but for most of human history, most of the scientists, that was not their paradigm. That was not their worldview. In fact, they believed that the world was ordered and we could understand what was in the world because we were called to steward it. As, as God's stewards of his creation. Um, and so then we have this question of, uh, has modern science actually done away with our ability to do that? And so we have basically five areas that we need to deal with, and, and we'll have a slide on each of these. And, um, and so as we work through this process of reintegration, of, of making what scripture teaches about origins and what scripture teaches about science, back to being the foundation of what we do. Uh, we'll have conversations about shared content. There will be times where scripture and what we're learning in this class will actually both speak to a particular issue. Can you think of any examples of that, where something you might learn in an organismic biology class uh, would share some information uh, with what scripture talks about? Can you think of any examples where scripture might speak to something that this class would speak to? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, what is, what is just the meaning of life, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, you get explanations about uh, the, the structure of organisms. And, but yeah, I mean, the, the, what does it mean to be a living form is a huge question uh, in the, that we'll deal with this in this class. And the Bible has a fair amount to say about what, it, what, it, what, what is living, what is not living, when does something become living, when is it not living? Uh, we also need to deal with some of the assumptions. So there are assumptions of, um, I mean, the Bible assumes that God exists, right? It doesn't go about explaining the existence of God or uh, defending the existence of God. But science is built on a number of assumptions that we need to talk about and deal with if we're going to understand uh, what this what this class should do uh, goals there are specific goals of science um, that we need to deal with uh, we need to talk about how do we how do we do science um, and what does that actually mean and uh, then this narrative and again this is kind of this idea of, of methodological naturalism all right so I mentioned that one thing we're going to talk about in this class and something that the Bible actually has something to say is this idea of what is life. And 
This is a fun question. We'll actually deal with this uh, for our homework assignment on Wednesday. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, surprise. It says something along the lines of why aren't viruses considered living organisms? And so we have to have this discussion of what does it mean to be a living organism? But before that, we, we got to talk about a biblical definition of life. And uh, so you basically have, you have two forms of life, um, the first of which uh, we can actually see in, in this passage here. So if you have your Bible or you have your phone with a Bible app on it, please open up your Bible or your Bible app to Genesis chapter 1, and we'll start at the very end. Not the very, very end, because we'll start in verse 30. The very end is verse 31. Give you a moment to get there. All right, so Genesis 1, starting in verse 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Continuing into chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Uh, verse 5. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living creature. And so in that passage, we see something referred to as the breath of life. And this is one form of life that scripture talks about. And it makes it clear that it's something given by God, but it also makes it clear that it's not, it's something that's not unique to man. That there are, there are creatures beyond man that have this breath of life, but it's something that it's given by God. Okay. And so this is something you might consider to be, um, uh, like a physical, just the quality of being alive. Notice there are some things left out from that la list. It talks about the beasts of the fields, the creeping things, which most Hebrew scholars interpreted to be reptiles and amphibians, uh, and then also the birds of the air. But it doesn't talk about the fish of the sea, and it doesn't talk about plants. Does it mean that those aren't living things? No, it's just not part of uh, that list. But I think this is making it very clear that, that life is, that there is this physical life, that it's something uh, that's, that's given by God. And this is, this is an important thing because it's, it's hard to actually define life physically. Like if you take a cat that's alive and a cat that's dead immediately after being dead, not decomposing very much, but and you compare them, there's not a lot physically different about the two, and yet there's something different about the two, right? So... Anyway, so that's one form. The other one we have comes from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. Give you a moment to get there. This is known as the prologue of the Gospel of John. It... Um, a lot of people have compared this to something that you would get at the beginning of a musical piece where you would run through a really quick excerpt that represents the entire piece and then you would then uh, proceed to go through the entire piece. Uh, so in many ways it provides a summary of the entire gospel but gives us a glimpse of, of another form of life. So John chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning, he was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the whole world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, and no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And so the other form of life that the Bible talks a great deal about, more so than just this characteristic of living forms, um, is eternal life and, and what you might consider to be true life, life in its fullest, life that we can experience partly now, but ultimately in eternity with God. And so Science has nothing to say about that second form of life because it, it can't deal with that. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment when we talk about how do we do science. But science has nothing to say about the second form of life, but a great deal to say about the first form of life. Um, although the cause is different under the reigning paradigm of science. So what is biological life? These are, so it's something you'll notice really quickly, these are characteristics of living forms. And these are helpful um, pieces of information to have. So uh, just one piece, um, cells are the smallest unit in which the characteristics of life are present. So that's an important piece to note, um, that there's nothing smaller than a cell that has the characteristics of life. All right? What are some of the characteristics of living forms? They grow. Yeah. They can move. They can move. Wow, that marker is uh, <laughs> too many people in between me and there. Um, so they move. Uh, another way we can say this is they respond to stimuli. Not all living things are capable of really directed movement. Uh, a number of marine forms, again, marine biology, I told you a little bit about me, a lot of my examples have come from here. A lot of marine forms are what are called plankton. They just float wherever the water takes them. They're not capable of actively moving in any direction, up, down, left, right. They just kind of go wherever they go, but they still respond to stimuli. Any other characteristics of living forms? Yeah. They have automatic processes like the heart and breathing. Okay. Not all of them have hearts and breathing, right. but uh, they... same metabolism yeah. so they have um, processes that that process materials and build other materials and so more complex forms will have more complex processes involved in this idea of metabolism that's another big one yeah they can yeah <laughs> it's a good one make copies of themselves And we use the term, we use the term reproduction, and, and even times we'll use that in um, like asexual reproduction, but sometimes it's, it still seems really, I mean, it seems like a weird term sometimes, but we'll go with make copies of themselves. Yeah, this is something living organisms do, and lawn living material sometimes does, but not in the same way living organisms do. Yeah. Adapt to environment. Yeah, okay. So we'll go. With, with that, but yeah, absolutely. So uh, do you said adapt? Yeah. So adapt's a little bit different. Um, 
we'll talk about this more. Uh, individuals don't adapt, individuals acclimate, uh, populations adapt though. The, the adapt, we use the term interchangeably, acclimate and adapt, but in, in biology those two terms have very specific meanings. Yeah? Would homeostasis be yes. under response to stimulus? Um, no, no, it's a little bit different. So we'll say maintain homeostasis, which is just a fancy way of saying that they maintain conditions necessary for life. Now you can stress them to a point where they can no longer do that, uh, but that's something that living organisms do. There's one more big one, and then there are a couple of other features of living forms. Yeah? Um, they contain or are a Yeah, okay. So they contain or are cells. This is a, a characteristic of them. It's not something that they do, but it is a characteristic. There's one more characteristic, and then there's one more thing that living forms do. Um, grow? Grow. Yeah, grow and develop. And so that's something that living organisms do, and non-living things don't do. Although, uh, artificial intelligence is starting to fit a lot of the descriptions of living forms, which is kind of fun. Yeah. There's one more thing that living organisms have. Real fast, could you read the last one again? Contain or are cells. Yeah. Sorry. One more thing that all living things have, it's not something they do. Have DNA. Can you read the red in the back? I didn't even think about that. Okay. And so this, I'll put stars next to things that they have, and then the rest are things that they do. And so uh, this class and just biology in general, biology means the study of life. And what's interesting is that word biology comes from the Greek word bios, which is the physical life, which you actually find that word in scripture describing just kind of a physical life, characteristics of living, which we know from Genesis 1 is something given by God. Which is nice because without that, it's very hard to explain what living, what it means to be alive, other than having characteristics of life. So, yeah, I mean, we deal with that, but it, it, again, it's still very hard to explain what life actually is. We end up explaining it by what living things do or what they have, which seems weird to me. It's like asking the question, like, what is communication, and just answering that with examples of how things communicate and not explaining at all what communication actually is. Which is another one that we, we tend to do because communication is, is something that's hard to define. All right, any questions about that? There will be some other points of shared content, uh, but they're fairly rare. Scripture is not a science textbook. You probably are aware of that. Uh, but there are some other points of shared content, especially when we talk about bacteria and our prokaryotic sections, th those are things that humans have known about, unfortunately, for a very long time. Um, not about the good bacteria and good prokaryotic life, but about the pathogenic forms. And so there is some shared content there as well. But any questions about the shared content? We need to talk about the assumptions of science. Just so we can put them out on the table, you know what the assumptions of science are, and uh, yeah, you know how to deal with them. All right? Cool. So this next question, what are the assumptions? And I'm going to tell you what the assumptions are as stated, and then I'll tell you what they actually are under the dominant paradigm of science. So an, an assumption of science is that there are natural causes for things. And things is a very technical term. I apologize for using such technical vocabulary the very first day of class. There are natural, that was a joke, by the way. Um, there are natural causes for things. So this, uh, this assumption of science predates methodological naturalism, but basically gave birth to it. So again, methodological naturalism, we'll see that in, in a couple of slides. I didn't mean to start talking about a term before it was actually slotted to come up, but I got so excited 
about methodological naturalism. I could not help myself. I'm sorry. So this is the first assumption. There are natural causes for things. Uh, another assumption is evidence from the natural world can be used to understand these causes. That is that you can take, um, if you have any event or any occurrence, not only is there a natural cause for it, but you can use present processes today to explain these causes. Evidence from the natural world can be used to explain these causes. And the last assumption of science is that there is consistency in these causes. And that is that the laws that govern um, the universe and everything in it are essentially unchanging. That there are laws that are in place uh, that govern how everything works and operates. So these are the assumptions of science. Again, these predate the dominant thinking in science, uh, but they basically shape what you can do with science. So if there are natural causes uh, for occurrences or for phenomena, um, if evidence from the natural world can be used to explain these causes, you're, you're getting a theme that there are certain areas of truth that science can't explore, okay? Science can't explore the supernatural. Science can't explore any causes that aren't natural causes. And that's okay. You just have to be aware of that. You have to understand that. That there are some questions that science can't answer. And if that bothers you, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but it, it shouldn't because science is just one of many tools by which we can understand the world in which we live. It just happens to be one of the more powerful tools in some ways. All right, any questions about the assumptions? Okay. Next, what are the goals? There are two main goals of science. There are two main goals, and these are the two main goals. Produce more accurate explanations of how the world works. And second, to produce more accurate explanation of the world's components. So those are the two main goals of, of science, to explain, produce more accurate explanations of how the world works, and to explain or produce more accurate explanations of the world's components. Those are the two big goals of science. I'm gonna show you another goal that's oftentimes presented as a science, but it is something science cannot do even though it's oftentimes presented as a goal of science. Okay. Any questions about this? You're like, hey, in your email, you said we we're going to start talking about viruses, and we only have nine minutes of class left, and you haven't mentioned viruses at all. I know. But we did. We talked about what are living forms, and viruses are not living forms. So. <laughs> yeah. Indirectly, we addressed it. OK. So here is um, something that is oftentimes put forward as a goal of science. Uh, explain how the world got to be this way. This is something that science cannot do. This is something that science cannot do, at least in the purest sense of what science is. In order to explain how the world got to be this way, you have to explain the cause, right? It's not just a matter of explaining the events, Right? If living forms exist, obviously at some point in the history of the universe, life originated. Yes? Okay, if life exists at some point in the history of the universe, life originated. We can explain that. You can explain the event through science. You cannot explain the cause. Okay? You, just, you can't do it. That is left open for philosophical thinking, philosophical questions of what is the cause for those events. And another thing that's oftentimes put forward as a goal of science, but something that even most scientists are honest that science cannot do, is explain life's big, big questions. The big questions of every worldview, right? Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose, right? Who am I? Where did I come from? What is my purpose? Most scientists, I think, are honest that science cannot do this. 
um, but some are not so honest about that. So science can't actually address either of those last two because science cannot explain the cause, which is nice. It should be encouraging to you to know that science cannot address the cause, which means science can be used to explain what events would have to take place in order for life to exist or in order to get the diversity of life that we have presently. But if science can't explain the cause of that, then we have to look to other ways of knowing. That'll be a big point of what we'll do in this class. Any questions on what are the goals of science? So now we're back to no questions. <laughs> That's good. It's like a pendulum. Never know what you're going to get, right? Like a box of chocolates. <laughs> All right, the last question we need to deal with. How do, how do we do, oh no, this is the second to last, I lied. How do we do science? How do we do science? Anybody know who came up with the methods of science? Yeah. Francis Sir Francis Bacon, greatest name, maybe ever. Maybe ever. Sir Francis Bacon. And so he came up with the methods of science, and uh, here are the methods of science. You start with observation. Now, the neat thing about observations is those observations can come from anywhere. They can come from scientific work somebody's already done, they could come from you sitting and watching a chipmunk peel a raisin. I don't know why, but they don't like the wrinkly skin of a raisin. So they'll peel it and eat the meat. I don't know why. Or watching a raccoon wash its food. I don't know why they do that either. They're disgusting and they're full of parasites, so it's obviously not helping. <laughs> but yeah, so these observations can come from anywhere, but that's where your scientific inquiry needs to start. Uh, then you come up with hypotheses to explain those observations. Be my guest to come up with a hypothesis of why raccoons wash their food or chipmunks peel their raisins. I don't know. At which point you go and you test your hypotheses. You put together a really well-developed, well-thought-out experiment to test your hypothesis. And this... This next point, this is a key and something to remember about all science. The next step is to interpret, interpret what you found. And so at both of these stages, in your hypothesis, you are explaining what you saw. And then in your interpretation, you are explaining the data that you accumulated here. In both these points of the scientific method, it requires the observer to now get involved and to insert their ideas into the process. Okay, and it's an important point to point out that science is not objective, at least not fully so. It can become so when you have a lot of people checking each other's work, but each individual scientific inquiry is not objective. It is subject to the belief and the beliefs and the worldview of the practitioner. That works. We'll go with that word. And then any good scientist, you repeat because you are not satisfied with your initial round of experimentation. So you repeat. Do your data match what you found initially? Do your interpretations still make sense? Notice in the methods of science, there's really no room for supernatural explanations. Although there is room for the worldview of the practitioner to enter in and, and has to uh, in how you interpret those data and even in how you explain your observations. Now we'll get to our last question just before our time ends. We'll talk, about, we'll talk more about viruses on Wednesday. We only talked very little about viruses today. It's okay, they're not living organisms, right? And this is an organismic biology class. Right, why'd you put them in there even to begin with? Because they probably came from living organisms. But we'll get there. All right, last question. What story is being told? And this is where we get to this idea of something that I've been saying a few times and said that we'll get back there. What story is being told?
It's, oh, by the way, if, if any of you are colorblind, you need to let me know, not, not publicly, because I can't actually legally require you. In fact, I could get into big trouble if you did raise your hand. Just let me know ahead of time so I know not to use red and green, because oftentimes I'll illustrate something with different colors, but if you can't tell the difference between red and green, using red and green is not helpful, right? So what story is being told, and this is something I've mentioned a few times already, but I'll write it down, methodological naturalism. And it's the idea that going back to the assumptions of science, which there are natural explanations for things, right, was our first assumption. Methodological naturalism would say that there are only, every cause has to be natural. There's absolutely, not only can science not address supernatural, but supernatural causes can't exist, okay? Methodological naturalism, supernatural causes can't exist. Science can't deal with them, therefore they cannot exist. The second assumption of science was that there not only are there natural causes for things, but we can understand those natural causes by observing what's going on today. And so methodological naturalism would say that only the way that the process, the way the processes work today is the, the only way that those processes could ever have worked. And that's where that third one comes, that there are consistency. But it's more than that in methodological naturalism. It's that everything is exactly the same. The rate, the process, everything is exactly the same, unchanged. All right? That's the story that's being told. We'll pick back up here on Wednesday, but we are out of time today. So remember, if you haven't already done so, complete the quiz and sign the agreement on Canvas uh, for the lab. If you have lab tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow. If not, I will see you on Wednesday. Thursday. Th well, Thursday in lab, Wednesday in lecture. <laughs>